Good morning. The message for today doesn't come from my uh, thought and, uh, and effort, but it comes from the president of the World Church of Seventh-day Adventists, Pastor Ted Wilson. Back in uh, July, he was elected as the uh, leading pastor of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. At our general conference session, which occurs every five years, they uh, elect a leader for the ensuing five years, and uh, Pastor Wilson was elected as the leader. And uh, so he has a message for the church at this time, because this is the time of the year where we have what we call the week of prayer, and uh, it is generally scheduled to be in... uh, in operation for uh, right across the world at the same time of the year. Um, It doesn't work as perfectly well as that, of course, because of various circumstances, and some churches may be a week earlier and some uh, a week or two later, but generally speaking, it brings the world church into focus on common themes with the purpose of... uh, adding to the unity of the church, strengthening the unity of the church, um, encouraging the church members in their faith and in uh, their confidence in Christ as the Saviour. And so Pastor Wilson is uh, taking this uh, first, or presenting this first reading by way of uh, the record, which uh, you may have in your hand. I'm not sure if you don't have it, Please ensure that you pick one up after the service today because there's a reading there for each day of this week. And uh, you will be blessed as you uh, read. And uh, they've entitled the week's uh, uh, emphasis, People of Hope. And of course, of all people, Seventh-day Adventists have a very strong hope because uh, the word Adventist portrays that thought Uh, naturally, doesn't it? Adventists, looking for the advent of Christ, the second advent, the second uh, time when Jesus will come to this world and will settle the problem of sin and uh, take to be with him those who are faithful to him. Well, Pastor Wilson, in an introductory letter to the church across the world, says... No promise is more precious to God's remnant people than Jesus' declaration, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. For more than 160 years, readers of the Adventist Review and millions of believers around the world have rejoiced in the blessed hope. That's what we have termed the second coming of Jesus so often, we've called it the blessed hope, something to look forward to with great happiness. By definition, Seventh-day Adventists organise their lives and their mission around the Saviour's pledge to return. Their confidence in the reality of the second coming changes the shape of their everyday experience. Uh, They make choices, they form relationships, they enter careers, all with eyes on the eastern sky, for we believe that Jesus will return and will be first seen in the eastern sky, which of course is that way, not that way. This year's week of prayer sermons are organised around the theme, People of Hope, and are built on the Apostle Peter's encouragement for God's remnant to live lives of holy conversation and godliness, so that we may be found in him in peace, without spot and blameless. Bear in mind that this old English word conversation really means your general conduct. So when you see that old word in uh, the Bible, uh, generally it means your conduct in general, not just your speech, but your conduct in general. Writers from different parts of the world have carefully prepared these sermons and materials, praying all the while that all who read or hear them will be strengthened in their faith and inspired to live the practical godliness that Jesus modelled and taught, all possible through his sanctifying power. The world needs and deserves to hear the message of Christ from a people who are Christ-like. When we are transformed by his grace, we will preach and teach and witness in a humble, loving and winsome manner. 
Focusing on the same central passage from 2 Peter chapter 3, Ellen White <coughs> reminds the church, Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. It is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for but to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Were all who profess his name bearing fruit to his glory, how quickly the whole world would be sown with the seed of the gospel. Quickly the last great harvest would be ripened and Christ would come to gather the precious grain. And Pastor Wilson goes on now to say, wherever this message of Christ's soon return has been preached with power and conviction, God's people have experienced both revival and reformation, and it will happen again. Minds are changed, relationships are mended, lukewarm hearts grow warm with love for others, and congregations lean forward toward the mission Jesus has given his people to tell the world. I'm praying, Pastor Wilson says, that you will open your heart to the Spirit of God as you plead for revival and reformation, leading to the latter reign of the Holy Spirit and Christ's return. I'm praying that you will be spiritually renewed by this year's week of prayer readings. I'm praying, he says, that you will reach out to those in your family, your church, and your community with the wonderful and life-changing news that Jesus is coming again. And he signs it off as if it's a letter, and he says, Sincerely yours in the blessed hope, Ted N. Wilson. And uh, he, uh, I understand, is a very humble man, and he likes to be called Ted. But uh, it is a very significant position that he holds in the church as he leads the, what, 18 million now Seventh-day Adventists around the world. And so... We can listen to what he says, I'm sure, with anticipation and respect. And uh, <coughs> he's entitled his uh, <coughs> uh, message for today, A People Who Look Forward in Anticipation, What It Means to Wait for the Lord. He writes, As he challenged fellow Christians to reignite their uh, passion for the second coming of Jesus, Peter, that's the Apostle Peter, asked, and we find this in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 11 and 12, Peter asks, What manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God? These are vital and encouraging words for us as servants of the Lord in the last days of earth's history as the great controversy theme comes to a climax. This passage in 2 Peter contains a question, an answer, and our hope. Taken together, they determine and define the quality and world perspective of the life of the believer. Let's think together about what these verses mean to Seventh-day Adventists in the 21st century awaiting and hastening the Lord's return. What kind of people? Well, Peter's question implies that there are different kinds of people and that they are identifiable on the basis of their command, commitments and the quality of their lives. He is particularly interested in the followers of the Messiah, the Christ, who are his fellow believers. They are a people among many other peoples who have come from different cultures and from different geographical areas, but who have been called together by the power of the living Lord into one people. There is a particular profile to them, a uniqueness that should be the possession of all in order for them to be kind of people that they ought to be. The question Peter raises is an important one, and it can be addressed to each one of us. What is your and my profile as a believer? What should a Christian look like? The question may not be a popular one, particularly in the Western world, where an overemphasis on individualism 
poses a serious threat to the identity of the community of believers. A believer shouldn't claim that who I am is a personal matter. We belong to a people, a remnant people. Guided by the Spirit of the Lord and grounded in God's revealed word, we have chosen to join a world community, a unique people. Therefore, it is appropriate and even indispensable to raise this question. <clears throat> what kind of people ought we to be? I realise that the question could be heard as potentially echoing elements of a legalistic way of life. But Peter isn't promoting legalism. He's interested in the impact of the saving grace of Christ on the life of a community of faith that is waiting for the coming of the Lord. The waiting makes it necessary for him to raise the question. The Christian hope isn't yet a concrete reality. We are still pilgrims on a journey. We wrestle with the reality of waiting. The question deserves a very personal answer as well. And what does it mean to you to wait for the coming of the Lord? The question isn't about the psychological component of the waiting. Should I be fearful or should I be uncertain or should I be joyful? But about how waiting for him determines the quality of our lives as followers of Jesus. And I just repeat that. The essence is, but about how waiting for him determines the quality of our lives as followers of Jesus. There's a uniqueness to the identity of the church that we must constantly underline, and that is inseparable from its message and mission. It is related to the biblical concept of truth, and therefore directly connected to the person of Jesus who without any apology claimed to be the truth. As Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, I am the truth. His uniqueness has transformed the lives of millions of Christians throughout history and will transform the cosmos itself. To those who follow Christ, Peter asks the daring question, what manner of persons ought you to be? The question assumes the need to express and preserve the identity of a believer in a world where we are constantly confronted with distracting and even counterfeit commitments and lifestyles. <clears throat> you ought to live, he subheads. Peter's question isn't a rhetorical one. You know what a rhetorical question is? A question that orators and speakers and preachers ask and they assume that you know the answer and they don't expect you to give an answer back is to stimulate your thinking. But Peter's question is not a rhetorical one. Left without an explicit answer without, uh, because it assumes that the readers will be able to answer it. It's not that kind of question. The question deserves a clear answer and Peter provides one. The question implied uniqueness and the answer explicitly, explicitly points to it. The answer is, you ought to live holy and godly lives. So it says Peter, 2 Peter 3, verse 11, you ought to live holy and godly lives. That's it. Clear and simple. To wait for the glorious return of the Lord means to live holy and godly lives. Lives open to the revival of true godliness that the spirit of prophecy pleads for when saying, a revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. To seek this should be our first work. A revival need be expected only in answer to prayer. Alan White wrote that in his found selected messages, book one, page 121, if you need a reference. This isn't so much a challenge as it is a magnificent gift granted to us through and in Christ. Holiness isn't natural to humans or to creation. In fact, what is holy is essentially unique and absolutely distinct from what has been created. Only God is holy. 
and he, only God is holy in himself. He is holy because he is the creator and redeemer. There is no one like him in the cosmos. He is the Holy One of Israel. Holiness reaches us through the presence of God among us and in our lives. To be holy is to belong to him. Concerning Jesus, Gabriel said to Mary, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. The holiness of God was manifested in Israelite sanctuary, but it is now embodied in Jesus, who became flesh and dwelt amongst us. It came to us in the gift of the child, and through him, that's Jesus, holiness is accessible to humans. It is to this divine gift that Peter is pointing as he answers the question, what manner of persons ought you to be? The answer is, in a world characterised by the unholy and the ungodly, let the Holy One be embodied again in your lives as individuals and as a people. The divine plan to have a holy people who wait for the coming of the Lord, uh, sorry, the divine plan is to have a holy people who wait for the coming of the Lord. Such a people will be unavoidably visible and will be a blessing to the human race. Through Jesus, the Holy One, they have become God's property. Notice that the answer to the question isn't a list of things. A list would set limits or circumscribe the potential of the Christian life through the work of of the Spirit. The call to holiness goes deeper and higher than that by pointing to the unlimited possibilities of character development. As the Spirit of Prophecy has so beautifully reminded us, higher than the highest human thought can reach is God's ideal for his children. Godliness, God likeness, is the goal to be reached. Each of us is called to make a heart commitment to the Lord Jesus each day. Divine holiness is transferable through the Son of God. It demands from us a daily and permanent contact with him. The church as a global people of God must display to the world and to the universe the glorious holiness of God. The Lord desires his church to show forth to the world the beauty of holiness. She is to demonstrate the power of Christian religion. Heaven is to be reflected in the character of the Christian. Little statement of Ellen White's. This holiness isn't only a pious life characterised by a daily devotion to God. That's part of it. But beyond that, it is a life of moral and spiritual integrity grounded in the love of God. We shouldn't ignore the moral dimensions of holiness. This is further emphasised by the term godly, which refers to Christian respect for and submission to God's will and the moral life. The overwhelming moral corruption in a world that pays no attention to God's law makes it indispensable for us to live a holy and godly life. Our lives are to be a powerful witness in favour of the superiority of such a life. <coughs> Sorry. Our lives are to be a powerful witness in favour of the superiority of such a life, one that is placed at the service of God and others. And so he's comparing the kind of life that is outside of godliness with that kind of life that represents godliness. The message of the church, built on the moral teachings of the Bible, helps us understand the nature of a holy and godly life. No church can advance in holiness unless its members are earnestly seeking for truth as for hidden treasure, says Alan White. And I'll repeat that little statement. No church can advance in holiness 
unless its members are earnestly seeking for truth as for hidden treasure. When that truth is incorporated into the life of the church, it provides our true identity. We must proclaim that truth in the fulfilment of our mission, but above all we must display it in our holy and godly life. This is surely one of the most urgent needs of the church as it actively waits for the glorious appearing of our Lord. And he subheads again, as you look forward. The holy and godly life is displayed by God's people during the time of waiting. People who live in this way are future orientated. We shouldn't allow our past to cloud our minds and nurture feelings of guilt. We shouldn't let it define or determine the quality of our lives in the present. We are totally unable to do anything with our past. We can't redress past experiences, but God can. And he, in fact, has done it. Our past was taken care of through the forgiving grace of God in the sacrificial death of Jesus. In him, God deleted our past forever and provided for us a transformed life that can bring glory to him. That's why the power of God's holiness is to be manifested in the life that we now live. We must leave the burdens of the past to the Lord and live in the present a holy life. <clears throat> a life of service to others. Our expectation, our future life with Jesus, changes the shape of daily life. We have hope for the future because of Jesus. What he has done for us on the cross and what he is doing for us in the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary is our intercessing high priest, and coming king. The cross opened up for us the possibility of a future free from the enslaving power and presence of sin and evil. The nature of that future is suggested by the answer that Peter provides to the question, what manner of persons ought you to be? As we eagerly expect our future eternal life, Peter reminds us we ought to live holy and godly lives now. Jesus' parable of the ten virgins reminds us that the mere passing of time doesn't necessarily make us ready for his kingdom. Only those who wait purposefully, with lamps trimmed and ready, daily supplied by the oil of the Holy Spirit, are growing in the holiness that prepares us to meet him with peace and joy. Only people who are continually praying for revival and reformation will be experiencing the changed lives and transformed influence that make the preaching of the good news of Jesus credible to millions of lost men and women. Truly waiting for Jesus and living a holy life is one and the same thing. We must constantly keep on looking forward to the day of God. In conclusion, he says, the question remains, what kind of people ought we to be? The answer continues to challenge us. You ought to live holy and godly lives, revived lives, reformed lives, lives filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. As you look forward to the coming of the Lord, Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. So says the psalmist in 37.5. As we commit ourselves to the Lord and through prayer plead for revival and reformation in our lives personally and in the church as a whole, the Holy Spirit will work in our lives, preparing us for the latter rain and the Lord's imminent second coming. Through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the holiness of Jesus will be increasingly seen in the lives of God's people and individuals everywhere will be attracted to his remnant church as they see the fruit of the Spirit 
in the lives of those who are waiting for his soon appearing. So I trust that this will be the experience of us as individuals and collectively as a church. We will demonstrate in the lives that we live from day to day that we are people waiting for the appearing of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Can you say amen to that? Let's bow our heads. We rededicate ourselves to the, <coughs> the purpose of uh, taking the Holy Spirit into our lives and preparing for the second coming. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have promised us all that we need in order to prepare for your coming and to be prepared. You've promised us your spirit. You've given us the written instructions, but you've given us more than that. You've given us the instruction that comes via the quiet voice of the Holy Spirit. And we thank you for that. We pray that we'll avail ourselves of all that you give to us so that we will represent you in this world of sin and darkness and at the same time be prepared to meet Jesus when he returns. Keep us faithful to you. Help us in our endeavours to do <coughs> that uh, great work of committing ourselves to you, to give up our own will and to take the will of Jesus Christ and uh, to live it and to do it and uh, to represent you in this world. We thank you for the blessings that you have uh, given to us up till now and we look forward to the blessings that will come to us yet unknown. We thank you and we pray it please in Jesus' name. Amen.